If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So Jason Phillips impressed me. Yeah. He really impressed me. I was really excited to introduce him to you guys. Yeah, yeah. really smart dude. Really cool guy, but yeah. really smart Very dude. knowledgeable with nutrition. I, I was very impressed. Super connected uh, in fitness too, right? Like he's worked with um, some of the best of the best Yeah, in lots of different arenas, CrossFit and bodybuilding. It's so refreshing to see a guy that has built a business around the CrossFit community and uh, been a part of it, trained CrossFit for a very long time, had tons of podium athletes and teams involved with CrossFit, but yet still will express some of the pitfalls that come with it. Mm -hmm. And it's just yeah. so refreshing to hear somebody like that because I feel like so many of these guys that have, have attached their business to CrossFit – uh, defend it, to, you know, defend it to its death. Like, yeah. oh no, it's this, it's that. It's just like, no, why can't? It's okay that you like it, you do you it, you're still around be a critic, it. right? But then also see all all the problems that that could come from it. Also, right? Yeah. There's always going to be a cause and effect. And he has the right mentality. Like his business, he's really addressing a lot of the individual needs, you know, coaching wise. That I feel like that's a big monster to tackle, and he seems to be doing a good job tackling. Oh it. man, I I really hope that we, and I know we're working on this with him, is working a, a way out to. Uh, partner up in a way with uh, with what he's doing over there nutritionally because we just we don't have any desire to get into the one on one coaching world or you know nutritionally giving advice to individuals which is what he has been building for a long time now and has been very successful in it so yep. he has and uh, if you haven't heard of him uh, get ready because you're going to be hearing a lot uh, of this guy he's he's about to like blow up in a big way very, like again very smart dude very connected. Um, you know, we're impressed by a lot of people we meet, but this guy really impressed us to the point where he came to record a podcast with us and we re wanted to do videos with him as well. So we did some YouTube videos that yeah. are causing a Those lot of- Those are taking off, man. They're doing well. <laughs> they're causing a lot of controversy. Me and him talk a lot about uh, IIFYM in the videos. We talk about paleo for CrossFit and a few other things, adrenal fatigue or HP axis dysfunction. So in this episode, you get to hear- about Jason Phillips. You get to hear about his business. You get to hear about nutrition um, and his experience coaching thousands of people through nutrition. Uh, it's a great episode. You're yeah, going to enjoy it. We get it. into CrossFit. We get into dieting with CrossFit. We get into all that stuff. All of it. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. Great episode. you can find him on Instagram at Jason Phillips underscore IN3. Um, you can find his website, IN3Nutrition.com. He's got a great blog on there as, as well. So uh, without any further ado, here we are talking to Jason Phillips. Dude, so I'm super excited to have you uh, in the place right now. And we were just talking off air that we wanted to get on the mics as soon as we could because uh, we always do this where we, we meet somebody for the first time and we blow our wad, right? We start talking about all the great wow. conversations. And everybody goes like, oh, man, I wish we would have heard that. Like, so It's like messy. Yeah. We, we really didn't fuck around much with Jay. I mean, he's only been in here for about five minutes. We lit the mics up right away so you guys could listen to... Uh, all of us get to know each other for the first time because we have a lot of mutual friends. We do. Yeah, we I, do. Didn't, I didn't we realize. Just out. Yeah, I didn't realize that Josiah is your workout partner. You're, you're mentoring Cody Boom Boom right now. So we got, we got a lot of same boom. same circle yeah, there. Yeah, Jay's Jay's a good buddy. How long do you and Jay go back? Jay and I go back. Earlier this year, really. Oh, okay. Uh, so Bedros and Craig connected us. Oh, okay. Um, Craig, so, Valentine. Craig Valentine. Craig mm Valentine. -hmm. And so I feel like they're the connectors of the universe oh, yeah. those two guys know everybody in fitness right in fitness yeah, yeah. i don't think we've met them they yet. don't know us so no know dude you guys need you to mean? meet them yeah. really yeah. yeah what what is your I've, you know i'm trying to be the hot i wanted to talk to somebody who actually knows bedros pretty well or has been around and what, what's your what's your thoughts on him i think that a lot of people would be surprised how reserved he is so like you look at his media and you probably think he's like out there and extravagant and like then you're around him and he's the most soft-spoken like humble dude oh wow yeah like you you'd probably think that he's the person that takes the center of the room all the time and uh, very few words are spoken. So I've, presence. I've found this out with a lot of these characters that have this loud, crazy, fun personality on YouTube or on their Instagram or like that. Then you meet them in person. A lot of times they're, they're the opposite. Different. So have you guys seen the YouTube ads with Billie Jean? No. no, like the the big black guy that's been into like marketing, and he, it's like Billy Jean is marketing. No, I haven't seen that, dude. Just look uh, up his shit because right. it's so outrageous, and he all does right. this like skit huh. where he's the wolf of Wall Street, but uh, he's like the wolf of marketing or something. But it's, it's really well produced, and so you look at him and you're like, this motherfucker must be crazy. Everybody I know that's met him says he doesn't say a word until it's like his turn, and then it's switch was flipped and. 
there he goes. And then he's like, on. then he's like, he's in character. Yeah. We, we just had these uh, these these young guys in here the other day. Inst- and, yeah, these uh, YouTube celebrity, yeah, kind of fitness guys. Connor Murphy. He's like twenty years old. He's got like two million people following him on YouTube. And if you look at his YouTube, his whole he's he's built it off of this like you know these skits that he does. He yeah. basically walks up to random Just girls, oozing charisma. He yeah. takes his shirt off. And, yeah, you he's know, ridiculously handsome. Enough. He's shredded. Yeah. And he's got this crazy outgoing personality where he just walks up to random girls and asks them stuff and then he ends up kissing them and he yeah. videos all of it. Super introvert and, yeah. in real life. Yes. No shit. Yeah. He doesn't make eye contact. Yeah. Like He even says it. He's like, I'm an all introvert. nervous. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Says he would never do that with I, girls. I wonder if being on camera or knowing you're about to you know, uh, present yourself it's like an on, act. Well, yeah. I, I wonder if it gives you permission, if it almost gives people permission to be something else. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I think that's what it is. I think uh-huh. that, because I'm relatively introverted. If you met me out like you'd be like that guy never talks but you know get me on a podcast get me on stage i'll go for days Mm -hmm. like i think it's it is it's that permission that you need to just go and to to drop whatever's in your head but man like i i for the longest time didn't want to fucking be in front of anybody i I hated public speaking and now i'm like get me on any stage i can be on. wow well tell us your story so how did you get into all of this like man it's uh it's a crazy fucked up story. So I feel like there's so many people that are listening that have at least heard it one time. So I'll try mm. to I'll try to spin it a little bit differently. Um, I got into fitness differently than most people, right? So I was 18, 19 years old. I was an athlete. We'll use that super loosely. I was playing golf. Um, <laughs> well, I was uh, John Daly is hey, an athlete. Hey, most, Tiger Woods making yeah, his comeback. Hey, bro, today. most right. challenging sport I've ever fucking done. It mm. is the hardest thing in the world, the most frustrating thing in the world. But um, but I was that I was pretty good i was nationally ranked and uh oh, shit. had college scholarship offers uh took one local to my house uh because of a girl shocker 18 year old uh, mm-hmm. hormones right uh, uh, th- thinking clearly yeah Those damn thinking girls. perfectly <laughs> yeah. And, All business. Uh, yeah so stayed close to the house but uh right after school tore my labrum and uh I have no idea how. Just went in the gym one day, got pinned under a 95 pound bench and couldn't move. I was like, yeah, that's probably bad. Mm. Um, it was really the first time I'd ever lifted. Like my, my golf coach was trying to get me in strength and conditioning. I was a skinny kid. And uh, in that process, like got in the gym to do rehab at the same time, got approached by Abercrombie to do modeling and was like, how the fuck I the do I story. look like these guys? Um, Cause they were like, you got to show us your abs. Like, you, you know, when you, when you come out for your photo shoot, make sure your abs are, are on point. Like, I don't fucking have abs, dude. Like I'm a golfer. I eat cheeseburgers, right? Like I eat, like I literally every day after high school went to Taco Bell KFC and like, like Taco Bell KFC, like it was a, they were joint venture and I, there was like a meal that I would get. Same thing, like tacos, chicken fingers, potato wedges. Clearly it was impactful in my life because I remember it. So right, vividly. right. And uh, so, you know, I, I started doing all this research, like how do I get abs? Like, do I do a lot of cardio? And, and my, uh, my pediatrician at the time was like, read, um, read all the fitness magazines because it's all diet. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. Like here I am. I like mac and cheese and chicken fingers. And <laughs> now I'm supposed to eat salads. Like, great. So I read all these articles. It's like, don't eat this. Don't eat that. Don't eat this. And really there was this giant list of shit that I couldn't eat, but no education as to what I should be eating. Mm. Um, before I knew it, like a meal to me, dude, was two rice cakes. Like I remember I was working at Best Buy. And my lunch was two rice cakes. Oh man. And, Supermodel uh, diet. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it was some kind of diet. dude. I mean, it was the, uh, it was the killer testosterone level diet. Yeah, I bet. And so, but it really developed full blown anorexia. Mm. Um, Oh, you did? Wow. Yeah, like was full-blown anorexic. Was oh, two days away. Fuck. Okay, well, you don't you, hear that a lot. From yeah, men. no, yeah. not at all. Yeah. And and what, what a crazy story for that to to happen. How? I mean, at what point do you do you know this? Like, I mean, obviously, you're talking about it now. Like looking back. So but, I was I was two days away from my mom and my doctor having an intervention. Wow. So like he my my <laughs> pediatrician invited me to go work out with him at the gym on like a Tuesday. And like afterwards there was a, uh, there was like a hot tub or something there. And he was like, Oh, like, you know, it's good for recovery. Like just come hang out. And like, he, he could tell with me, like I was almost embarrassed to like take my shirt off, dude. Mind you, I'm 118 pounds, wow. like five, nine, one eighteen. Wow. Like skinny as a rail. And he was like, clearly could tell something was wrong with me. And, um, you know, so they were, they were two days away. And then I met a trainer. You're, you're 19 gym. right here. Let me get sorry. 19. 19. Yeah. Okay. You're 19. So at and this point you have no idea that this is a, you have an issue with food. No, like to me it was normal, dude. <clears throat> and like, if I told you stories, dude, it was, it was fucked. Like I would have dinner with my family. I would, um, I mean, it would be healthy. It'd be like chicken, rice, green beans. And I would like almost beat myself up for actually eating food. I would go straight to my room and I would do crunches. 
Oh, wow. Thinking like, oh, I just put fat on my body because I ate food. Can I work the soft? Now, like, food you, was yeah, like yeah. that's that's what I thought. Food now, was the enemy. Did you have this personality where you're like, I have a goal, I'm going to attain it, no matter uh, whatever cost? And was that what you applied towards diet? And do you think that led to it, or was it more of a control thing where you felt things? It was a control thing because okay. I definitely was not a hard worker growing up. Um, I was probably the laziest kid known to man. Mm-hmm. Really? So yeah, which is really mm-hmm. ironic because now I think I credit this is a really fucked up thing to say. So I hope nobody takes this out of context, but like I went through that period of time and you learn so much discipline. Um, like you're focused so much on one endeavor. I think that's why I'm successful in business today hmm. is like, I learned how to block out all the noise and just to like myopically focus on one thing. That's not mm. a crazy thing to say. I think yeah. the, the most successful people can take uh, challenging situations and take the positive from it. Like this is what I got yeah. out of it. Not that it was a positive right. situation, but it it, it, it it's made. Yeah, because I would never now. want anyone like yeah. I would not wish that on my worst enemy. It was the and to be honest, it's a nervous system disorder, right? Like I would be remiss to say that I don't still have any body image things going on in my life today at thirty three and somebody that leads education around hmm. you know nutrition and implementation. Do you think going through that made you a better communicator to? clients 100 percent. Oh, I, I think actually i would argue a lot of the reason for my success is the empathy i have for mm-hmm. the relationships that clients have with food especially and, as as a oh, male to have yes. gone through that not a lot of men have gone through that or at sort. least want to Ooh, talk about i was it. gonna say i won't say that not a lot of men uh, have yeah. wow. not a lot of men talk about it so oh, wow. yes. okay because i've been so open mm-hmm. about it i have a lot of men in the fitness industry names that you might be surprised about that have come up to me and have opened up about it and oh, been like, shit. dude, I went through that shit. Well, you know what? Now that you say that, I believe this because we've, and we talk about this on the show all the time. Like, you know, we've, there's some of these Instagram celebrities that are 3% body fat, like fucking year round. It, like, well, like that's, <laughs> that's a, a whole nother thing, right? right? Like we get into like, cause I'm sure we're going to talk about diet and whatnot <laughs> we'll at everywhere. some point, right? Like there's backloaded images. That's yeah. so fucked well, up. But, like, right. And I mean, are they really 3% year round or are they showing you pictures that right, they took in like a three month span? Right. Right. Yeah. right. Like, that's, that's a real thing too. No, yeah. both those I think are big things. I think 100%. you've either got one, the guy who's, who actually really does stay that way and is actually technically unhealthy. And then you have the other ones that are faking it that they're doing. They're, well, they're, they're men, men, we, we tend to ask for help at a much lower rate than women Mm -hmm. because we're conditioned to think that it's weak. We're pussies or whatever if we ask for help. Or we just don't even know that that's an option. I don't even think it's a problem. I don't even think it's an option or or it's a problem, (laughs) especially if you're suffering from something that's been labeled a female disorder like anorexia. Now, if you say bigorexia, you might have more guys stand out and be like, oh, yeah, I'll, I stuffed my face with all this food and I took all these weight gainers. I mean, that's what right. I did, right? I had, a, I had an eating disorder as well. It wasn't anorexia. It was the opposite where I would stuff my face to try and gain yeah. weight. doesn't make it any, any different, but I could definitely see how it would be difficult for a man to come out and say, hey, I've got this disorder that female models talk about having. Well, it's really interesting because I think that for me coming out of the disorder, I don't ever think I looked in the mirror and said, I'm anorexic, right? And so at the time, when I when I created the recovery, I uh, my hormones were fucked. Like I literally, at 2 p.m. every day, I could not stay awake. Like wow. if you paid me to stay awake, I, I couldn't do it. Just yeah. cortisol resistance Just probably. cortisol was fucked, testosterone yeah. was fucked, yeah. everything was bad, right? And so the only job I could get that I could hold was opening up Gold's Gym from 5 a.m. to 11 a.m. Because I'd wake up, right, cortisol through the roof, like, or, you know, just enough energy. Um, Like, looking back on it now, cortisol is probably really low, but um, had just enough adrenaline to go on. Um, And so I was opening the gym 5 to 11. One of the trainers saw what I was doing to myself. She's like, you never fucking eat. And so this bodybuilder would come in every day, like, around 4 o'clock, and I'd be like, I want to look like him. And, uh, you know, he was lean. He was getting ready for his contest. He was getting ready for, like, nationals or something. And she's like, well, she's like, I do his diet, and I do his training. And I was like, Phew can you do that for me? Cause that's what I want to look like. And she's like, yeah, absolutely. You got to go home and you got to eat 4,000 calories. <laughs> and You're bro, like, Wait I minute. literally, no, I didn't fucking question it. Really? Like that's the fucked up part. I was it. like, seriously? And she's oh, like, yeah. Shit, you went like, one. Wow. I dude. went zero shock. to a hundred real quick. Oh, like, shit. and so this is before my fitness pal and all that shit. And wow. I went to Barnes and Noble that night, bought a calorie counting book, a calorie wrote counting. out a 4,000 <laughs> calorie, calorie meal plan. And followed that shit for like the next three weeks. And now, that's I, a, that's looked, a total... I looked in the mirror and I wasn't fat. And I'm like, holy fuck, this food thing's not so bad. Yeah. And so I don't ever, like now I look back and I'm like, well, yeah, I was anorexia. And my parents, you know, or I was anorexic. My parents tell me, yeah, you were anorexic. But at the time I didn't have the awareness. Mm-hmm. Okay, it was so... a total disconnect, complete disconnect. Complete disconnect to be able to, because you have to, for the listeners to, to comprehend this, 
for somebody to go from not eating anything to then eating 4,000 calories overnight is, is it, it's robotic. It's disconnect. Like I'll do it. It's yeah. It's mm-hmm. literally action without any emotion. Hmm. Like there it is no, there's no emotional attachment to it. Yeah. So, but wow. So you start doing that. So I started doing that. That was super impactful in my life. Right. Obviously I, I was a business major at school because I feel like that's what everybody does coming out of school. And I was like, okay, I found something I care about. I found something that I'm super passionate about. And this shit saved my life. Cause I was, I was in a downward spiral, man. I was depressed. I had body image issues. I didn't like, I, I mean, I had a, <laughs> I was going to tell a story. Like there was this there's this girl that like I had chased in high school. All of a sudden she wanted to like date me and I like, I pushed her away cause I was so like, had such bad self, uh, self image, self worth. And so I transferred to Florida state and, um, majored in exercise science with a concentration in fitness nutrition. And I said to myself, I'm like, from this day forward, I'm going to pay it forward. And I've been coaching people literally ever since. Oh, wow. wow. Cool. Now this is a, this is a very, this is a great story. First off, cause you tell it, um, obviously it's coming from the heart. It's very honest, but also because, Objectively speaking, uh, if somebody were to look at you, the average person, they see this fit, good looking dude, you were a model. Mm-hmm. Um, and to, for you to say, I suffer from these things, I think it's very powerful right. because it, it helps communicate to people that it, uh, has, it all, has almost nothing to do with how you actually look. Nope. There is no objectivity there. Nope. Were you able to look at yourself objectively at all during Never, this period dude. of time? Not, not once. And like I look back on pictures now and I'm like, that's not how I perceive myself. Isn't that, There's, crazy? Isn't that and, crazy? But I would argue people that don't have full-blown eating disorders still have oh, yeah. some body dysmorphia. It runs rampant. And I, I think mean, we and I think all it's the do. Crux I think we of all do. Eating coaches yeah. in every facet mm-hmm. of our life because it's not just diet, right? Like we all label the diet industry to be like, if I have a cheat meal, I fucked it up. Well, mm-hmm. if you spend an extra hundred dollars outside of your budget, did you completely fuck your budget? Like. It's like, yeah, it's off of what you anticipated, but you don't think the end of the world of it. Yet, right. if you eat an extra hundred calories, all of a sudden the world's going to end. So we, did you start to actually the picture so enjoy the food like as you went through the 4,000 calorie uh, <clears throat> process? So there was still fear and there was still trepidation. And I tell the story in my book, right? And um, and so then I went, like when I went to Florida State, I was, I, I was like, okay, great. I can eat a lot of food. I'm not going to gain fat. I can be quote unquote normal. And, but then all of a sudden my buddies are eating like Chipotle and they're eating pizza. And I'm like, well, fuck, like that's bad food. Right. I, I was still labeling food as bad because I didn't have any education really. And I'm like, that's terrible. Like what's going to happen if I eat Chipotle? I'm going to wake up fat tomorrow. <laughs> and so I avoided it. I avoided it. And finally, like three months into being at school, I was in a situation where I had to eat the Chipotle, right? Like it was either look like a fucking weirdo and like starve myself or just bite the bowl and eat it. And so I did. And I swore up and down, like it's, it's like vivid in my memory. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and be fat and woke up first thing, looked in the mirror, abs are still there. And it was like, it was this trust building process. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I had to do it with Chipotle. I had to do it with pizza. I had to do it with like pretty much every food, man. And, uh, so there was definitely a connection there, but I, it was, it was like a trust building process. Mm. It's interesting. I remember, uh, uh, distinctly for myself, there was a moment where I was over at a friend's house and uh, we were doing um, like push ups and stuff, and I had my shirt off. And there were two mirrors, and one would reflect off the other mirror. And so I caught a glimpse of myself off of the back mirror. So it was from an angle that I never see myself from. And in that moment, I was able, because I didn't recognize myself in an instant, right. I was able to objectively see myself. In an instant, it was a very surreal crazy. moment for me. Because most people will never get to that. You know, you you don't. It's very difficult to to. It's very difficult to separate self image from body image. We identify so much with our body that that's what we think we are, and we would do it with our thoughts. We do it with a lot of things, but especially our body. That for that instant, when I was able to see this body that I for real quick wasn't able to identify as mine, so I could objectively look at it, and all of a sudden I said, "Oh shit." I'm muscular, which I had never thought before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had never thought that before. It was a very strange feeling. So everything you're saying is totally resonating. It's making tons and tons of sense. So well, you, And you didn't have a disorder at that time. So think about it with somebody who like already perceives really shitty things about themselves, mm-hmm. right? And, and then flip the script on that. And it's like, well, what if you see yourself in that a very objective point of view? And it's like, there's a little bit of fat on the oblique, right? Which inevitably we're all going to have unless we're like contest lean. <laughs> Like, holy fuck, now now you're fat, right? Now all of a sudden the thoughts, they run rampant in your head. And like, 
that was a vicious cycle, dude. It was pretty, it was an ugly time. So it after, is. after college, did you go, uh, like into the virtual world and start coaching online? Did you do a lot of one-on-ones? Did you work for a, uh, like a chain? Like how did so you- back in college, I, uh, I got the golf bug again and I was like, man, I'm going to walk on Florida state. They were powerhouse in, in like the golf space. And they were like, no, we don't do walk-ons. And I'm like, all right, fine. I'm going to turn pro. And so I got like, got my game back together. I was good enough. I turned pro. Um, I actually spent a year and a half on like the mini tours, like Hooters tour. Um, <laughs> had a, a little tour. success early. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. Uh, you would think it was, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a quick way to go broke to be completely honest. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was uh, a lot of hot wings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of wings, a lot of travel, a lot of, uh, uh wasted money, uh, but candy. Yeah. you know, looking back on it, I was like 22. It was a quick way to grow up. And, um, you know, when you got to live on the road by yourself at 22, you, you grow up pretty quick. And, um, so I did that and looking back on it now, that was a pretty defining moment for me because I kept choosing fitness over golf. Were you, right? were you as muscular as you are now? So right now, right now I'm like 190. Mm-hmm. Back then I was probably like 170. Mm. But you got to think, right at five nine one seventy, they were like, "Oh, this guy's fucking Ronnie Coleman." <laughs> I know because right? like, it's not like... typical, right? You see all these golfers; they're not real, like no, they're not physique, you know, driven. No, well, <laughs> which ironically now you're starting to you're starting to see more of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but back then it was unheard of, and I kind of chose fitness over golf. And like I remember, uh, you know, tournaments, people would be out practicing on the range three and four in the afternoon. I'm like, "Fuck, I got to go to the gym. I got to go do chest day." Which like no golfer should ever do chest day, right? <laughs> like it's the worst thing. You get the most like restrictive thing for your swing. But I'm like, I got to have a good chest. And like, so some of the eating disorder, it wasn't eating disorder. It was a body image disorder. Mm-hmm. It was kicking back in. I'm like, man, I can't look like a golfer. I got to look mm-hmm. the way I want to look. And so probably contributed to me sucking and and ultimately losing all my money. Um, so I, I, I did that, you know, kind of bounced around. Yeah, like. Went out to LA, like did the trainer thing out there. Do you remember the show, The Workout on Bravo? Yes, yes okay. dude. So I went out there for season three. Oh, um, Were you yeah. on the show? Oh, dude, so I'll tell you a good story. Oh my God. Um, all right, so I was literally like, my, my golf career was coming to a close. Um, I'm like laying on my futon in my apartment in Orlando and I see the workout come on. And I'm like, those guys fucking suck. I'm like, I'm a better, I'm like, I'm a better trainer than them. Like I should be on that fucking show. Pretty much everyone on TV. Isn't that the right? cast? Yeah. It wasn't Greg Pitt part of that cast. Was it? Who was, he, okay. So one, I'll tell you. Yeah. Like I ended up hooking up with Greg like a little bit later. Um, so I, I call them and I'm like, and this is like, this is my MO dude. Like, and this is like, I tell, I tell the story one, cause it's really funny, but two, like people that listen, take fucking action. Like if you really want something, go fucking get it. Right. Um, so I call them and I'm like, Hey, I, I feel like I should work at your gym. Like, are you guys hiring? And <laughs> so they were great. like, you uh, need me. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Like I will come make your gym better. Uh, they were like, ah, like whatever, like send us a resume. So I sent them a resume and I don't know if it was like the pro athlete thing or something, but something caught their eye and they were like, Oh, like this is really cool. Like, and, uh, so I get on the phone with them and, and they interview me and he's like, cool. Like I will, uh, I'll talk to you Monday. We'll talk about like what it looks like coming out to the gym. And, and you know, when you move here, you've got a job. Cause I bullshitted. I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely moving to LA. I had no fucking clue when I was going to move, how I was going to move, but I'm like, this will be rad. And so I call him Monday and I'm like, is so-and-so there was a dude. And they were like, no, he doesn't work here anymore. And I had like, I had just gotten done for 48 hours telling the world that I was moving to LA oh, to work shit. at this fucking gym that's like on a TV show, <laughs> right? Like telling my mom, I was super pumped and they were, they were like, yeah, like he doesn't work here. And I'm like, oh, well, no worries. Like, you know, I, he told me I was going to work there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I'll see I'm going to, uh, uh, when yeah. should I come out? And they were like, oh no, like we're, we're putting a freeze on that. Like we're oh. not hiring. And I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, you know, and I was like, at this point, I'm like, what the fuck do I do? So I'm like, no, you don't get it. Like he, you know, it was all good. Like I, I get it. Like you won't hire anyone else, but I, I need to come out there. And they were like, no, like, you know, I'm sorry. Like we have some internal shit. And I'm like, fuck. So like, how do you hack that? Right. So I, this is back in the days of MySpace, Right. And so yeah. I go on MySpace. I find Brian Peeler. Uh, he was like one of these, like the bald headed guy from North mm-hmm. Carolina. And I'm like, Hey man, I'm going to be in LA next week. And, uh, I'm training for a bodybuilding show, which I wasn't. And <laughs> I, love it. I was like, uh, I need you to work. I need you to train me and kick my ass. Cause you know, I'm, I'm running low on energy. And he was like, all right, it's 350 bucks. And I'm like, great done. So I book a flight, I fly out there. Like the whole purpose of me being in LA for 48 it. hours is to go in and train with him for an hour. Wow. Go in, start working out. I don't even give a fuck what we were doing. 
But I was like, for 60 minutes, I talked about why I should be working there. <laughs> I walked out of the gym with a job. Yes. Oh, wow. And so, so awesome. So I left there, right? Got my job, moved my shit out to LA. Um, they actually offered me a spot on season three, uh, but the contracts were miserable. Like there was a statement in the contract. We can take your words out of context. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, no way. That, would be, that would be like me saying like, so-and-so is a dick. And then they'd like take another statement where I said, Jackie is a, and they yeah. like put the two together. Jackie's a dick. Yeah. No, motherfucker. Those are two completely different <laughs> statements, but and I've they, heard, they I've heard horror totally, stories of shit like that. Oh, dude, wow. they wanted like they wanted residuals on like any money that you made. Like it was bad. They wanted like they wanted to give you like a thousand bucks a month too. Like it was bad. Damn. Um, but it was cool to be around the environment. Greg sure. Plitt came out. Um, you know, he was around not very much to be honest. And yeah, it was so staged. Uh, <laughs> it, it was oh, dude, it was so bad. And I didn't sign an NDA, so I can talk anything. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Shed some light on that shit. I just remember the the main girl just hooking up with all the straight girls, I'm and like, that how? never happened. Like, well, okay. it happened. Like, they hooked up, but she never turned her. Like, they hooked up, but it <laughs> right. wasn't like a it wasn't a thing, right? Like, uh, it just it happened like once, and they built this whole storyline like, around. Wow, it. she is uh, a cougar. Wow. Yeah. Mm. How much of it was bullshit? Like, and how much are these Everything. guys really? <laughs> oh, yeah. I literally I walk in one time and there's a camera on. And Greg is, he's standing in a doorway looking into an office and they're, they're filming him from the office. So like, it's like, he's talking to somebody in the office, but there's no one in there. nobody in the office. <laughs> and then like, there was something one day where he took his shirt off, like filming a client and there was no cameras around. And the producer's like, Oh, that's really good. Do that Can you again. do that again? <laughs> yeah. And so like, they went back out like, and like recreated. reenacted it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so how so, long were you there? Yeah, and then, yeah, then we're, so we're, I was there for like. I was there for like a year, you know, realized, hey, it's hard to really make enough money in L.A. And so then I like I bounced around, man. I took a corporate gig in D.C. I opened up my own business in Orlando. I actually went back out to L.A. Um, and then it kind of came full circle. I trained a bunch of guys on the PJ tour. Why? Why all the place? Why Orlando, D.C.? What, what's with the <sighs> dude? You'll you'll find like I just fucking love to travel. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I just feel like I'm a little, little bit nomadic. And um, I mean, I could give you all the places like I had a corporate gig in D.C. Like it was a. Like, have you heard of the chain of Export out of Chicago? Export sounds familiar. Sounds very familiar. Just, they're, Chicago. they're a big, so yeah. yeah, anyone in Chicago knows who Export is, right? Yeah. Chicago, and yeah. so they opened up a DC office, and so I ran their PT department. That's what got me to DC. Okay. Uh, my sister happens to be the executive assistant to the, the owner of all of Export. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got hooked up there. Um, so what keeps you, okay, now that's a, that's a good little probably story right there, is that you have a connection like that, and yet you're, you're still not involved in it. Why not? Involved with export? Yeah. Oh, dude, it's corporate. Yeah. Right? Like, so I, I went in the very first month there. I, like, I sold more training in, in a pre-sale than they had ever had sold in a whole month. And they were like, oh, let's let's work you up the corporate ladder. Like, let's take you to Long Island. And I'm like, ah, like, this just isn't, it wasn't fulfilling, man. It was, like, it was sales. It wasn't interpersonal connection. And, like, now that I'm, like, in a position where I can look back on my life and be like, why did all this shit happen to me? I realized nothing was ever personal enough. Nothing ever had enough impact. Mm. And I live like a million, you know, you and I were messaging yesterday. And like one of the things you said to me was like, clearly I've had an impact on people's lives. Like that, that statement meant more to me than you'll probably ever know mm. because I live so much to create impact. And so like looking back, all of these things happen and I moved on beyond all of them because I wasn't having the ability to create impact the way I wanted to. Who created a uh, impact for you? <sighs> Man, I look back, obviously the trainer that, you know, that got me out of anorexia. Um, I don't know as though, like, it sounds super cliche, like my parents, mm. right? Because now that I'm old enough and I understand finance and all this shit, I realize how poor we were growing up. And I realize how I had every opportunity that the rich kids had. Mm. And like my parents strapped themselves to to give me a fucking good life and to give me the opportunities I potentially needed to succeed. Um, and I think that inherently that was built into me to where I will, I will sacrifice every ounce of my being for the people around me. Do you remember when you put that together? Like when you, cause rarely ever as a kid, as you're going through mm -hmm. that, do you put no, that? Together? It wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't. Right, we're it normally wasn't in my we're normally selfish. We normally yeah. think the world revolves around us. Yeah. Our parents have all I these. I need. Things. I need. And then That's you and then you look thing. back now. Like, what, was there a pivotal moment for you where you realized, like, holy fuck, I didn't realize that my parents really didn't have all that, and they really did fucking sacrifice everything. I for think me. it was the first time that 
you know, like when like going out of college, like my mom, you know, she's like, get a credit card, I'll pay it. Right. And I, I remember getting to the point where I looked at the credit card statement and I'm like, you're making minimum payments. Like something's off here. Right. Uh, and then to the point where one day she was like, Hey, I, I can't pay your credit card bill. Like, can, can you pay it? And I was like, I started like the, the wheel started spinning. I'm like, uh, something's weird here. Like you there's, you've never told me no. Um, and then I just started, like, I think I started looking deeper into things than I ever have. Um, but there's not there's not one pivotal moment mm. where I'm like, ah, that was it. Like, that did it. Um, I have a pivotal moment where that I attribute to my success today. Uh, like, we, uh, Bedros calls it my my Thanksgiving miracle. So we've all heard, like, the Christmas miracle, right? Right, right. So three years ago, this past Thanksgiving, <clears throat> I was broker than you could ever imagine. Um Woke up. Is that a word broker? More broke? Yeah. We'll go, <laughs> with, it, we, we, we'll go we, with it, right? Like I said it and I was like, yeah. fucking yeah. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I just sounded really bad. I used uh, electronic no. the other day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We just uh, make words up here. Yeah. So I woke up. I was on a ski vacation and I woke up in the morning and I looked at my bank account and I was overdrawn. And like Thanksgiving Day, checks don't clear, like can't deposit money. Like nobody could bail me out of this. And mind you, I have the longest running streak with getting Starbucks that I think any person in the world might have. <laughs> and so I, I had to go get my morning Americano. Like it was non-negotiable. Like how to do it. So not only could I not afford that, but I couldn't afford the Thanksgiving dinner I was supposed to be buying for my girlfriend and I that night. I'm like, fuck, what do I do? And so like we're in the grocery store that morning and I happen to look at my bank account again. And for whatever reason, like Thanksgiving miracle, a $500 check cleared and I had money in my account. And like, I literally remember like how fucking shitty I felt that I couldn't afford something. And I was like, never again. Mm. And I knew that success was a function of value. Went home and just was like, whatever I have to do to serve this world, I'm going to do it. Mm. And anyone that knows me knows I'm not short on work. So at the peak of my coaching career, before I scaled and brought in other coaches, I worked with 167 clients. Oh, and anyone Wait, these that knows, are one, these are one on one, dude. Oh Holy shit! And so shit. everyone you, how, that works with me gets a, a twenty to thirty minute phone call every ten to twelve days, and I was literally taking calls twenty hours a day. I bet I had to, right? right? Yeah. But it was. I have a very hard time if someone sends me an email and they're like, "I need help." I know that there's not that many places out there that are giving the level of help that I feel like you deserve, right? Like you mm-hmm. guys would agree. Like mm-hmm. there's some decent resources out there, but a lot of internet coaches are, are taking your money. No. Yeah. And I'm like, no, like that's not what we're doing. So I can't see you go to those people. I'm going to work with you. I'll find a way to get at my schedule. I'll sleep an extra half or half hour less. And uh, then I was like, all right, I got to scale. And that was like the genesis of, of our business. Talk about mm-hmm. the challenge of that. A lot of people have a hard time scaling from that. It's one thing to build a you know, six figure business for yourself. And yep. then it's another thing to build yourself a company or a business where you have multiple employees. What, what right. was that like? So I'm massively thankful for, um, for my first employee. Cause if she hadn't done a good job, <clears throat> I'm not sure the business would be where it is. Mm. Right. She could, she was project X. Hmm. If she fucked up, I may not have had the trust to bring in other coaches. And so I brought her in. I was like, Oh, can I, can I really teach somebody the skill set they need to be a good coach? And I think that number one, I've done a good job identifying people with enough empathy to be good coaches. And so people are like, well, how do you hire? I hire good people. I don't hire skill sets. I hire people. Um, so she was a good person. I taught her the skill set of nutrition coaching. And of course, me being the control freak I am, I oversaw everything for 90 days. I'm like, I want to see all the prescriptions going out, all the communication, all the results coming in, blah, blah, blah. Um, she crushed it. And, and so then I brought in another one, same process. And we've been fortunate enough to do it. Now, I've never given up a client to another coach. So for me to go from 167, and today I coach personally 50 to 60 people, um, which is still a lot yeah, by most people's still standards, but to me that's that's nothing, uh, right? Wow. Like I was on calls for three hours before I came over here this morning, and then I'll go sit in the airport for another five hours and do it. But that's like a normal day for me. Mm-hmm. Ask my wife. She'll be like, he's always on the fucking phone. <laughs> yeah. um, but that was that was how we did it, man. It was a, it was a massive trust thing for me. Wow. Mm. How do you find balance? My wife and my kids. Um, so I became Insta dad earlier this year. Uh, <laughs> All right. so, uh, my wife had three kids before Whoa, uh, before we got together, yeah. and oh, so okay. I uh, I became a stepdad to three kids. Dude, oh, talk, yeah. how old are they? Eleven, nine, and six. Talk about that transition because I I'm divorced and yes. I have a girlfriend now that lives with me and my yep. kids half time and 
I could I, I can only appreciate that that challenge of moving into like you had no kids and now you got three. So right. <laughs> it, there's a lot of challenges, um, but there's a lot of reward too, man. Sure. Like it is, it's really cool to see a kid very happy. Like mm. I, I've always found my gratification in making other people happy. Like back to like high school years, you know, like having the girlfriend that like you buy a gift for and she's super excited, right? Like I always thought that was the coolest thing in the world, not because I was gonna get laid, but because it was just cool. Like, mm-hmm. It was genuinely awesome. Like I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to be that kid that bought their parents a house, bought their parents a car, right? And you know, I can I can say that I've paid some mortgage payments for my parents, and that we've you know we've helped out with their cars, and so that's super cool to me. Um, seeing my kids light up, or seeing the the step kids light up, like when we do things for them, it's priceless, dude. So it's given me another level of work ethic that I didn't even know was within me, and that's scary yeah. for a lot of people because I'm a hustler. Um, but there's balances, right? So over the summer, when I wrote our uh, I wrote our education platform, I wrote our level one manual the most time intensive thing I've ever done. Like I would wake up in the morning and fortunately they like to sleep in. So I'd be up at five. I would write till like nine or 10. They would all wake up. I'd spend the day with them. And so I was basically like five to 10 non-negotiable. That's my writing time. Now all of a sudden they're back in school. I had to get their asses out of bed at six 30, mm-hmm. right? They don't fucking leave the house till seven 30. So I'm like making breakfast, making sure their shoes are on, jackets are on like oh, yeah. fucking organ. Like, you know how that goes, oh, right? Yeah. Like, and so we get them out. Then we come home. The 11 year old, he goes on the bus to go to middle school. So I got to get him out the door at eight o'clock. And then it's like, all right, well, I got to go work out at 830 because if I wait till the afternoon, I'll just be exhausted and I won't get it done. So I've lost like my morning like creative time realistically. Right. And I've had to find another time. And that's just in the past. Like it was I never would have lost that. Mm-hmm. Um, so things like that. Um, you quickly learn that you never come first. You know, you. You do family dinner, guess who eats first, right? <laughs> guess whose plates get made first, right? The kids' plates always get made first. Right, right. Um, and if kids are like little dictators in the house. Dude, they totally are. Yeah. <laughs> like, like if I, like we make, we make fucking, like we'll make chicken, right? And like it'll, like my wife will bake it and marinate it and uh, I'll look at it and I'll be like, I need, I need 10 ounces to hit my macros. And I'm like, I am how much they're taking. I'm like, you little motherfucker. I'm like, if you take more than that, I'll fucking kill you. Take that like, fork and just stab it over. take that piece. Um, yeah. But I'm like, oh, I need 10 ounces or like, you know. And, and then of course, like if they take more, I can't get mad. I got to be like, all right, now I got to fill in like an extra two ounces. Like, where, do I, where do I get 16 grams? Dad gets the biggest piece, yeah. right? That's so. the rule. <laughs> no, my kids are, because because my girlfriend would make this big, like elaborate dinner. And then my, my daughter will look at it and be like, I don't like this. You know, my son Dude. and my son will like oh, eat it, but like plug oh, his nose. Brutal. <laughs> okay, I can eat it. I'm like, that's you great. little. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like looking at her, like, don't take a person like this yeah. is yeah. kids. Like, like kids these are, are just, kids. Yeah, yeah, kids are just a little dictators. Brutally yeah. honest. Too. Oh, dude. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about your your nutrition philosophy or sure. kind of the cornerstone. Like, what separates your philosophy or your your company's philosophy with nutrition? How you approach it versus other people? So I've tried to I've tried to narrow that down and. I continue to think about it. I think it's going to be an evolving thought process for me. You know, it's very cliche to be like, well, we customize, right? That's not new. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that for me, like what it comes down to is the implementation. I think that there's so much knowledge out there. I think realistically, any person listening to this could go to the internet, Google and find every answer they need. But it's how do you fit that into your lifestyle? How do you, how do you do it with a date night? How do you do it with, well, I want to drink beers on Sunday for football. How do you like how does all this how do all the pieces fit together? That's where we've excelled. We've taken individuals that don't have the knowledge, we give them the knowledge, and we also provide the implementation and the support, because inevitably you're gonna fuck up. Um, you know, inevitably you're not gonna be motivated. Uh, inevitably you're gonna get injured or you're gonna travel or you're gonna have a business meeting. How do you handle that shit? Um we are the 24 seven on demand coaching service. Uh, we basically build a concierge service, hmm. right? Where I've got athletes, they'll go to lunch and they'll be like, text, text us me a picture. Here's a screenshot of the menu. What do I get? And it's like, well, I mean, you know, every macro site will be like, oh, I'll just find something that fits your macros. That's not what they want to hear. Mm-hmm. They want me to help them guide them through. So I'm going to ask a couple questions. We're going to figure out what they normally right. eat. Right. And we're going to figure What'd you it eat out. earlier? What'd you eat yesterday? But that okay. little accountability piece, dude. That text message, being there in that one moment, it took me, what, five seconds in my day? Mm-hmm. That moves them forward on a level that they never would have moved forward on. Who's uh, more challenging to coach, a professional athlete? Because I know you're talking about <laughs> yeah. MMA uh, fighters and versus like your average person. Well, an MMA fighter is probably the easiest person because they're coming to me in a camp 
and they know that if they miss weight, like there's a pretty significant financial penalty, mm-hmm. right? right? They're going to lose half their purse. So they'll eat um, whatever. Yeah. So they will eat dog shit if I told them to eat dog shit. Right. Um, I mean, the final week before a fight is never fun, but they, they suffer. They're used to it. So I wouldn't say that they're hard. Pro athletes are, they like to rely on their talent. Um, you know, I think the difference, like I just started working with a, a guy in the NBA, won't say who, but, you know, he came to me, he's really successful made a lot of money last year he's like i want that like lebron type money and he's like i know the difference is dotting my eyes crossing my t's super successful but you know you could get somebody that's like like my my pro golfers on the pga tour they're like whatever i you know i swing golf club getting them to be compliant is relatively hard um your average so i'd say it's 50 50 man like you've got the same the same issues with pro athletes that you do with, uh, you know, with regular people. Yeah. And as far as sustainability, do you find like a, a stark difference with that, with athletes versus like, you know, just coaching your average person? I'm trying to think, because I think that inevitably I could, I could tell you, I could give you the really good examples of pro athletes and I'd give you the really shit ones. And then mm. I could give you the really good examples of regular people vary. and yeah. the really shit ones. And yeah. I think that there's always this line of demarcation where people are complacent or they're not. Um, and it's the same with pro athletes, right? And so you'll get, you know, you know how it is. You see the, the regular people that become successful and they're like, oh, this macros thing is easy. I could do it on my own. Uh, and then they leave you and then they come back three months later and they're like, oh, okay. I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. Hmm. It's the same with an athlete. Any, any CrossFit athletes that you deal with at all or anybody? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, talk about that. What that's like. Yeah. So, I mean, I've last year, I think I had 12 people at the games, Okay. maybe, maybe more, um, that is probably the single hardest one. Mm. Um, and why? Because CrossFitters have this thing where they think CrossFit <clears throat> should be all about looking good. Uh, and as we all know, to achieve low levels of body fat, um, you need to be in a somewhat of a deficit. Right? You sacrifice like, some performance, usually. which will sacrifice performance. Which at the levels of CrossFit and the levels of exercise they're doing now. So we're looking now at intensity, but we're looking at intensity at volume, right? Intensity at high volumes is going to fuck your hormones up, undoubtedly. So now you've got, and there's a really controversial statement out there. I won't say who said it, but everybody will recognize it, that people should get to a low level of body fat before they become competitive. Mm. I think that statement's bullshit. Mm. Um, I think that's actually the root problem of most of the CrossFit issues that come to me. So I get people coming to me all the time. Well, I'm only eating 1,200 calories. Why am I not losing weight? So that statement in its absolute form, right, if, if you told a woman, let's say she's 150 pounds, she might have a better chance at high volume gymnastics at 135 pounds. Undoubtedly, she needs to lose some weight. Sure. If you tell her that two weeks before the open, right, and she's only eating 1600 calories and tell her, well, you need to be lighter for your gymnastics. What is she going to do? Yeah, she can compromise her strength. and everything. She's going to eat less yeah, calories. Yeah. And she's already in too much of a deficit, right? We know fail. that. But in her head, she's going to be like, well, fuck, I'm going to eat less calories. You're gonna eat 1,200 calories. But now it's gonna happen. You're gonna suck shit worse. You're gonna make you're gonna make your hormone your hormonal profile worse. You're gonna exacerbate all the underlying issues. So then by the time that you do get to me, come June, you'll be in a pretty bad place. It might take me a year to fix you before we can really get back into things. Hmm. Um, How do you back people out? Because we talk about this on the show all the time, and it's somewhat controversial, although it's becoming more accepted now. Where we'll get you know competitors that'll come to us bikini competitors or bodybuilders mm-hmm. or whatever and they're eating their the, just the metabolic adaptation the, yep. the, their their bodies are burning very little calories even though they're doing lots of cardio and they're eating very little and they can't figure out why their body just won't respond anymore yep. how do you what is your approach to backing people out of that and i know it's it's definitely an individual thing but are there some some general guidelines that you so the first thing i think is so in our education platform um we live by the quote, education drives compliance. So when I'm teaching coaches how to coach, I'm telling them first, you need to educate your clients. If you go into a situation and you tell a client, hey, listen, I'm going to raise your calories, irregardless of the outcome, because we have to restore maintenance calories. Um, And you don't tell them they might gain weight. They're going to send you the middle finger and be like, peace Mm -hmm. out, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to go back to the asshole that would starve them. Um, I I definitely will reverse diet them out. and the reality is, and I wrote an article on metabolic adaptation and reverse dieting, there's three potential outcomes. One, someone's going to hyper respond. You start increasing those calories. They haven't been metabolically adapted very long. They're going to start losing weight, right? And, and those are the people that trainers love to be like, hey, look, I increased so-and-so's calories and they're fucking shredded. Mm-hmm. Like, 
you got a really good situation thrown your way because it's not always going to work that way. Right. The other outcome is you're going to increase their calories. Um, biofeedback markers, physiological responses are going to improve, right? They're going to sleep better. Their hunger response is going to improve. They're going to get their sex drive back. Um, they're going to have some energy, but the weight's not going to change. Body comp might improve a little bit, but weight's not going to change. Mm -hmm. That's a decent one to deal with, right? Then you're going to get the people that are fucked, right? That you reverse diet them. You know you have to get the calories up. It's non-negotiable. They're going to gain some weight. So I always tell the example, I had a woman come to me from Oregon. She came to me and I was like, yeah, it's going to be a while before we can lose some weight. She was eating like 700 calories a day. And this is like, she did like exercise tapes, like Tybo, mm. like, like five of them a day. And I was like, like if she wasn't like cooking or working like with her husband, like she was working out. She felt like she constantly had to be moving. It took us like a little over a year to really finish the reverse diet. And she gained like eight pounds. So here I am like telling somebody that comes to me for fat loss, hey, by the way, yeah, you can eventually lose some fat, but it's going to take you over a year for us to even start. And right. At that point, you're going to be even heavier. And you may put some, yeah, put some weight on a little That's the way. fucking hardest thing in the world to it tell is. a client. But we had that conversation on the front end. I earned her trust from day one. I told her what was going to happen. I told her that I have the long game in, like, in my best interest, in her best interest, right, at heart, and, and that she had to trust the process. I had her read articles. I sent her stuff. So we created a level of education for her. She trusted the process through and through, and we ultimately hit our goal. And it's it's the education piece is so important because we hear terms like metabolic damage, and and I think people feel like something's wrong with their body when in reality their body's acting exactly the like way it's it supposed to. Yeah, it's actually doing a very good job adapting. We were not born to be fucking stage ready, <laughs> yeah. right? That's not why we were put on the face of this earth. Yeah. Some people maybe they should be because they look damn good doing it, yeah. but. You know, it's uh, that's not what we were put on this planet for. Yeah. And so what about uh, helping with the hormone profiles or what about exercise wise? Do you folk may place more of a focus on like straight set resistance training to build muscle mass? And so you asked about CrossFit, right? Mm -hmm. And the one thing I try to do with CrossFitters, I try to get them to do less CrossFit. Um, <laughs> and you want to talk about a fucking battle, right? Because they're like, well, I came to CrossFit. Here's that's what how you, you lose need to fat. Do. Look yeah. at the top level CrossFitters. They're all ripped, right? Like, why is that not going to work? Those are the worst. By the way, top level any athlete is the oh, worst yeah. representation worst of, uh, yeah, example of what's <laughs> They're only the one percenters, man. Like, yeah. But you can't tell anybody that. They're on TV, yeah. right, right. right? Like, they're on TV. They're the face of CrossFit. And CrossFit has sensationalized. Right. You know, they're starting to move towards that's the appearance of what a CrossFitter should be. Mm -hmm. But you go in the average person, CrossFit, look at, look at our culture today, right? Western culture. We overcaffeinate, we overstress, we undersleep, uh, we under recover. Oh, and by the way, let's take the most intense modality of training known to man this day and let's throw that on top because yeah. that's not enough stress in our life. Yeah. Let's just add you a need fuck more ton more stress, sure. right? right? Yeah. yeah, more intensity. Yeah. So, and then let's eat less calories and let's create zero recovery and let's just bash our hormones. And that's essentially what's happening. So again, I have to educate them. I have to teach them what's happening with intensity, understand what happens at intensity, get them to pull back. When I can get them to pull back and trust it, we always have success. Um, but a lot of times, man, it's it's reducing the intensity. It is doing things like straight sets, um, taking some some of the higher forms of, of cardio away initially. Not saying they can't go back in, but initially. Um, it really comes down to stress, right? The fundamental, the fundamentals of transformation are stress and adaptation period you intentionally impose a stressor your body has to be able to facilitate an adaptation mm -hmm. if you've reduced your ability to facilitate adaptation you will not get said adaptation which could be fat loss which could be hypertrophy which could be strength whatever it is and we're all intentionally compromising those things you know with under recovery, right? Or unintentionally compromising those things by not recovering, not sleeping. And we don't realize it, right? Like we're, we're living in the, the sensationalized culture of hustle mm. and work and, and more intensity. Well, and don't you feel like those type of people are the ones that gravitate to those type of workouts? hundred percent. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. I always say on the show, look that at it's the like, pictures on Instagram, right? right? It's like the people that don't need to be doing that are doing it the most. And the Fuck people yeah. that ne could actually use a little bit of that in their life well, are not doing the it. way I explain it to people is, you know, when you're that type A individual, when you're go, go, go all the time and you're getting that cortisol to rise all the time and your body's starting to become resistant to that cortisol as a, as an adaptation response, Getting it to go higher will temporarily make you feel good. Yes. And so you get a lot of these people who are like, you know, what are you talking about? These high intense workouts make me feel yeah, amazing. I feel awesome. I feel great. And it's like, well, you know, and, and you actually will gravitate towards them because you get that immediate feedback, not realizing that 
like insulin resistance, you're dealing with a situation where you're not feeling your cortisol. So if you keep pushing it up higher, you'll start to feel normal. But eventually that runs out and you get to the point where you're (laughs) absolutely screwed. I mean, I've seen some people that were, I mean, in terrible situations. And for people who deny that this can even happen, I mean... There's, you know, we've done studies on POW. It happens with drugs too. Think oh, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Think about what drugs, right? You have the first initial drug, whatever it, be, it be, may be that someone's taking. It's like, I get all these positive effects. So what that leads me to do what? More. Yep. And then I get the more. And then you just end up chasing it like crazy, trying to get that feeling. Meanwhile, you're doing all this damage to your body. I think that's where people just have a hard time connecting that. Well, and the sad thing is, you know, you're talking about cortisol. It mm-hmm. sometimes gets worse before it gets better, mm-hmm. right? And so then you take somebody who's been doing a lot of intensity and you're like, hey, I need you to do less intensity. Oh, I need you I need you to eat more. Well, what happens initially? They get more tired. Of course. They're like, what the fuck? I thought this was going to help me. Why am I more tired? Well, think about it, right? Like your body's natural <clears throat> state to recover is what? It's sleep, right? We recover the most when we sleep. Like our, our cortisol rises, our growth hormone rises. That's when we're in a position of actually recovering. Well, what the fuck do you think a fatigue response is? Your body's saying, hey, motherfucker, I need you to re- need I need to, to recover. Yeah. Like, you need to do more of this shit to sleep. And I'm finally not stressed enough. I finally am not putting out so much cortisol. I'm finally not fight or flight. I'm not in my sympathetic nervous system. I actually want to live parasympathetic. I want to be rest and digest. I mm-hmm. want to sleep. That's a good sign. So people that are pulling back on your, on your training and on eating more and you're like, I'm more tired. Great. You're going down the right rabbit hole. Keep going. You'll lose the fatigue. You'll be in a good place. I tell people that the only way out is through. You have to go through it. You can't avoid it by saying, okay, I'm going to avoid some of the withdrawal or the symptoms of at some point you're going to cut the the substance off, whatever that may be, whether it's intense exercise, drugs, alcohol, whatever. And you're going to feel your body go through that period of adaptation. It's going to feel like it's going to feel like shit. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, and I mean, it's like you mentioned with drugs, right? Like right. I mean, you, you pull out of drugs and you know, you got that withdrawal. I mean, with cortisol and, and training, right. it's a little bit different, but it's that same initial just feeling like shit. Well, the, the tough part I find when I'm working with people with this is that they, they compare, they don't realize that the human organism, the, the, you know, and I say organism could encompasses all, all things, emotional, physical, whatever, that it is a constant changing state. <sighs> and what they do is they say, well, I am working out very little. I'm only working out twice a week. Normally, I was working out five or six days a week, so I'm, I'm not doing too much. But the problem is that they're, they're comparing their current workload yep. to a previous state that their body may have been in when, in fact, right now, your current state, that is too much. If it's too much, it's too much. And yep. sometimes that means two days a week is too much. Dude, I worked with a guy that was so... We, and we did saliva tests on him, right? And we looked at... Um, we can call it adrenal fatigue. We can call it HPA dysfunction. We can call it DHA to yeah, cortisol whatever ratio. Call whatever the fuck you want to call it, it exists, right? There's lab values around DHA and cortisol. <clears throat> we looked at his DHA cortisol ratio. It was so fucked. He was borderline stage four adrenal fatigue. He was wow. deep stage three. Wow. Right? We made him not train at all for eight months. Like zero. Like you could go in and maybe ride the bike under zone one, if that even exists, mm-hmm. right? For like 20 minutes. Wow. And this is a guy that at his peak, I think in like 2012, he placed top 20 in the world in the CrossFit Open. Oh, shit. Like, so this guy was like wow. a legit athlete. And we took him out of training for eight months. And the first month, dude, he was like relieved. It was like he was waiting for somebody to be like, oh, finally, I don't have to train. Right. But he, you know, classic mentality. Like, mm. you know, the other, Sal, to your point, the other one is people are like, oh, I'm only training twice and versus six times. Right. Well, if you're only training twice, but now all of a sudden, like you're also working five more hours a day, you know, you're working sure. seven days a week, sure. you're, sure. you're caffeinating triple what you used to be doing. You, you went through a breakup, right? All these things, they factor into your ability to recover, mm-hmm. your ability to perform. They're, they're responsible for cortisol production. They're responsible for hormonal output and everything comes back to those things. Now, I also find that people in this state, you know, again, whatever you want to call it, I like to use HPA axis, you know, dysfunction. In that state, I also find almost every single time a f- some form of intestinal hyperpermeability or yeah, otherwise oh yeah. known as leaky gut. Yep. How do you how do you work with that? Or do you test for that? Do you do things like a pinner test or or So I have I actually brought a hormone specialist on to my staff mm. because we get so many like that. And mm. I put him through um, the FDN course so that we have the ability to test in house. Actually the facility I'm looking at opening is is a, an area where we're looking to go deeper into that. Um you know, it, it's not the primary thing that we jump right into. Um, you know, whether the lab test shows it or not, we know that the treatment is ultimately going to be relatively the same, right? Mm-hmm. Reducing stress, change your dietary intake, change your your output. 
So I'm going to try to manipulate what I can first. And most of the time, the the insurance won't cover it. So that's the reason we don't go the lab test route first. Um, that being said, if we're not creating compliance or if we're still not seeing results, 100%, I go straight into lab test. And and you're right. I mean, I think that... It's almost like they, they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand, man. And people don't realize it. Your gut's your second brain, you know? And so if you're just abusing yourself from a stress point of view, if you're abusing yourself from an exercise point of view, which really are the exact same thing, uh, you're crushing your guts too. Now, let me ask you, so you've been in fitness now for a while. Yep. It wasn't that long, because I'm not that much older than you. It wasn't that long ago where if I said something like HPA axis dysfunction or, you know, uh, intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut, and I said that in a fitness circle, They'd laugh me out of the room. 100%. I was a wacko, yep. woo woo, you know, wellness you, guy. You were a holistic guy. Yeah. Right? Like, because holistic used to be such a bad connotation. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, you're natural. You're a fucking granola. Yeah, you you're, smell you're, bad. You're, you're from Oregon. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> you're from Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, you know, it's, uh, yeah. Like, now I think that people, people it's starting to merge, it. dude. But at the same token, I think people, we're going to see it shift too much of in course. the next five years where, Everything is going to get played on the GI, of right? Of course. It's, it's, like, hip, it, it's already really happening right now. Right. It's, it's like already, keto. It, it's like, right? yeah, and then it, we called the keto supplement thing before yeah. it ever happened. As soon as keto hit, we were like, Gross. leave it to the fitness industry. Oh, yeah. We're going to have a supplement to get you in so ketosis. We, so we well, called was it, we, it. Was it keto that brought the supplements in or was it the supplements that made keto sexy again? Right. Because I started seeing the supplements pop up and then everyone under the sun. And I, It's like, true because oh, keto has been around for a long time. This keto diet. Where the fuck have you been for the last 30 years? Right, right. Like, yeah. I'm only 33 years of age, and I've seen it come and go at least twice. Right. Mm-hmm. But things go in cycles, dude. I remember, like, and I don't know if you guys have been in the bodybuilding world, oh. like, for, you know, how, like, George Farah, the prep coach, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. so when George got really popular, he was, uh, right before him, Dave Palumbo was really popular. Oh, yeah. When and he so did his Dave, anabolic, was, yeah, Dave was the keto diet. guy, yeah. right? And so everybody was prepping on keto. All of a sudden, George comes along, and he's like, well, fuck keto. Everyone needs carbs. I remember picking up a muscular development magazine one day and the cover, it said carbs are back. Yeah, I remember, Carbs are back. Where the All fuck right. did they go? Yeah, dude, like, I, did they disappear? Everybody's been avoiding us. I bought yeah. that. I bought that magazine. Right. I actually remember it saying that. Oh, that's hilarious. And, and I mean, like, you know. Everybody like, high fives. Yeah. <laughs> carbs. Where did they go? Yeah. You know, and, and so, and I've been around the industry long enough and everyone always asks me, well, how did you get your knowledge? Well, the truth is, man, like coming up in the industry, I hired everybody I could. <laughs> I wanted to learn their methods. I wanted to pick their brain as to how they worked with clients. How did they, you know, track data? What, like, what was going through their mind? Because I wanted to see, man, like, they're the experts, not me, coming up in the industry. And so I had worked with, like, Scott Abel. And Scott Abel's, oh, a, wow. big, Scott Abel's a big high-carb, low-fat guy. Um, he was I'm a wrestler, like, right? Uh, no. No, Scott, uh, Scott's from Canada. Okay. Yeah, and he... Um, I mean, was he from that whole, that, was he from that crew? Muscle that, camp. Oh, okay. I know yeah. That, okay. Back with like a and yeah, like when yeah, they yeah. were all traveling around yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the cycle diet guy. Yep. He's the guy that like, if you ever hear a Cito talk about somebody ate a whole cheesecake from the cheesecake factory and got leaner the next week, that was Abel. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, it's, so it's funny cause bodybuilding with all of the bad things that it's done and brought to the, to the fitness industry, there's also a lot of very fascinating, interesting. They were things. the ones out experimenting first, right? They're the, They're the ones, ones that were taking the risk. That's first. it. That's it. You, if you read like some Vince Garanda's work, oh yeah, from way back in the day, you're talking about you know way back in the in the black and white days, pre steroid era. Vince Garanda's talking about increasing your cholesterol intake and getting stronger, yeah. you know, and we're hearing that cholesterol kills you. And, you know, and of course now we have studies showing that if you do bump your cholesterol intake, you will get stronger yeah. in all these different things. So very fascinating. You know, as far as carbs are concerned, um, I responded very well to eating lower carbohydrate, mainly because I had probably some leaky gut issues and I had a lot of food intolerances with foods that contained carbs. But it's important to also note that there are some people with HPA axis dysfunction, you cut their carbs, they get thyroid problems. Forget mm. about it. They get thyroid. Some got, of them get thyroid If you've got HPA problems. issues, mm. you should be putting carbs back yeah. in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the guy I told you about that we made take uh, eight months away from training, mm-hmm. at the peak, we had him on 500 carbs, mm. right? And if you think about it, what's the shutoff mechanism to cortisol? Right. It's insulin. insulin. And so what are we trying to do? If your cortisol is jacked all day because you're constantly fight or flight and you can't shift to parasympathetic, what are we looking to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're looking to shut off cortisol as much as we can. It's yeah. true. Feed because the you motherfucker could, some carbs. It's true because right. you, ins- you could raise growth hormone and cortisol still rise. Yep. It's the insulin Absolutely. That'll, that'll drive it down. It's the insulin. That, and that's where, you know, for the uh, internet marketing crowd, that's where Kiefer's backloading was predicated on. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Like it was, well, have protein and fat at breakfast. 
you're, you'll uh, you'll stop the anti-catabolic or the, you'll stop the catabolic nature of cortisol, but you'll keep growth hormone elevated. Yeah. So you've got you know an anabolic um, you've got an anabolic environment. Cortisol stays elevated. It's it's catabolic, but you've got protein and fat to spare the muscle, so it'll instantly attack fat because cortisol is non-selective. That was the thesis, right? In uh, not so many words of carb backloading. Yeah, it didn't take quantity into account, and so no, I, I no, don't think uh, it went very well. No, but. I think a lot of bodybuilding science is, you know, yeah. one plus one equals two, and sometimes yeah. it doesn't. Sometimes yeah. it equals three. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, but and <laughs> but but yeah. they they I mean, a lot of times they 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 point in the right direction. Things are always moving. The they're they're on the cutting edge, and I think people want to dispute you know dispute it because pro bodybuilding is usually sensationalized by steroids. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you look at the natural scene, like Joe Kozemski, Lane Norton. Like, I think they, they're they the first two I ever heard talking about macros. Mm. Um, well, Lane was my, yeah, Lane was for us, for sure. Right. And so, you know, and, and Lane learned from Joe. Mm. And so I think that they were the first two to really talk about macros. Macros are, they've been around a long time because of those guys, but they're really becoming sexy like the last three or four years. Mm-hmm. Uh, Even that's starting to go too far, though, with the, oh with the IIFYM crowd and the... You know, how do I fit these pop tarts and donuts? In well, I'm my sure diet you've heard day? us yeah. bash that stuff yeah. before, right? We've well, so it's interesting. So people come to us all the time. They're like, "What's your approach? Is it macros?" And I'm like, "Well, everything comes down to quantity." <laughs> Listen, like if you eat 500 calories of salmon and broccoli, you're going to be metabolically adapted. Mm-hmm. If you eat 5,000 calories of salmon and broccoli, you're going to be fat. Like it, it's it is what like, like calories do matter. Sure. Like so to say that macros are the only thing that's important is completely false. But then it's like, can you eat Pop Tarts and donuts and get stage shredded? Yes. Right. It's been proven. But does stage shredded equal epitome of health? No. Fuck no. There you right. go. Right. So I operate in like, and I don't know if you guys have seen this concept that I put out. I operate in the triangle of awareness. Right. And so I say there's somebody that has performance goals, they have aesthetic goals, or they have longevity goals. And there are three very distinct points with three very distinct sets of goals mm-hmm. and subset of mm-hmm. non goals within them. Right. So if you're telling me, and you're coming to me as an athlete. Let's use my fighter next week. Your goal is to win your UFC match. Don't give a, I don't give a fuck, fuck about it. If you want to be 100 yeah, years yeah. old, because yeah. you're not going to be 100 years old. You're going to take a lot. I really don't that. care what you yeah. look like when you're fighting. If you win, you collect your paycheck, and you win knockout of the night. I did my job, mm-hmm. right? If you come to me to win a bodybuilding show, do I want to keep you healthy? Of course I do. I want you alive on that stage, right? I don't get, you don't win the show. Phil Heath didn't win the Mr. Olympia because he bench presses more than Kai Green. Right. Right. Like he. Or just, that he's healthier. Right. Like you don't. Right. There's no biomarkers involved. Right. But if you want to be 100 years old, you're not going to try to catch passes in the NFL. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. You're not going to try to get on a bodybuilding stage. And so where every person that's listening right now has to take a step back and be like, all right, where am I? Yeah. Because if I say I want performance, if I'm a CrossFitter, if I want performance, how much cosmetics do I want? How much longevity do I want? So how far away of that that definitive point of performance do you want? It's funny because the very act of competing at a very high level is anti-longevity. So bad, dude. Yeah. Matt it, Frazier is not going to live to be 95 years No, old. they've done autopsies <laughs> on uh, long-distance ultra-marathon runners who suddenly die at yeah. the age of 45, and their hearts look like yeah. they're you know 80 years old from the oxidative damage. 100%. So what I like to tell people is, because the average person, most people you know, listen, who are listening right now have no desire to compete at those types of levels. Most people listening are just like, look, man. Which is I, why they shouldn't be taking advice or information right. from this. Amen. Right? <laughs> they, they just want to look good. They want to feel good. They want to be able to work, you know, their job, be successful, and all that stuff. And I like to tell people, look, if you're really healthy, you're going to look fucking good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to be stage ready. You're not going to be, but you're going to look fucking being amazing. Being stage ready is not feels like shit. <laughs> yes, right? Like, yes. if, like it's not a fun place to go. Like no. even being photo shoot ready is not a fun. No, place it's to amazing. Go. It's amazing what uh, the perception that people have because of the lights, the stage, the cameras. The well, you, you mentioned know, Instagram earlier, right? Right? People will be stage ready and they'll take a picture. Oh, look at me! I feel like a million bucks. No, you don't. No. Yeah, yeah. And like, like let's get a camera on you the last seven days. Right, and let's right, see right. how many times you exploded on someone or like right. just a yeah. fucking. Uh, Day, hungry, right? not like, sleeping well. Yeah, like you don't feel good. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's that. You, you, and the other thing too is if you develop a good awareness and connection to your body to understand what your optimal health is, right? Then that becomes your home base. Yeah. And it's where's that home, middle point of all a, those? It's a good home base attributes. because when you're an extreme competitive athlete or you're pushing your body to these crazy limits, your home base is health. 
mm-hmm. versus extreme because I see this all we see this all the time, right? Extreme performance, hell, uh, you know, extreme performance, extreme, you know, body composition. And then when I'm not competing, there is no home base and it's fuck all. It's yep. all of a sudden yeah. you see these people off season and they're not recognizable. Well, and it's like we live in this comparison world, which it's social media has made it super easy to do. And so you look at Instagram and, and so people think, well, the, the picture of health is abs. And as a female, it's probably not the truth, right? Some are genetically gifted with a set point low enough where that is the truth. But right. as a female, it's probably not the truth. And so now you get these females out there that think the picture of health is abs. And so they're chasing abs as their picture of health when in reality, they need to chase set point. Mm-hmm. Right? They need to understand that every navigation away from set point is going to come with some sort of adaptation, some sort of internal compromise from their body. And so, again, like going back to the education piece, if you can get a client to understand where their set point is, where they're comfortable navigating from set point as a lifestyle perspective, then I think that you're probably going to win long term. The, the point to that is that it's good for you to to put stress on the body occasionally. Yeah, as long yeah. as you have a good, solid home base and you understand where you want to return. Yep. The problem that most people have is they they find that stress, then they attach themselves to it, they identify with it and becomes dogmatic about it. Like, yep. that's my approach because they had some sort of success with it because the body adapted, it changed, it showed them some sort of a response. Now I'm fucking married to well, it. Well, dude, in CrossFit, we see that in two ways, right? One, you get the you get the idiots that go in and they think paleo is a good diet for CrossFit. Like, you're going to tell- talk about that. That's a great Whoa. controversial discussion right there. Paleo is the single worst diet for CrossFit. Ooh. Um, Woo. So, like, that, that's that, like that's a true that's statement. Spicy. And here's the thing. It's if funny you, that's controversial. I know. Because it's, 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 it's just factual. factual. They're like yeah. staple It's just factual. And actually, marriage. if you right. go ask Rob Wolf, yeah. he would say the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if, actually, us. if you eat, if Love, you read, Rob. what is it? Eat, uh, Wired E? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He actually talks about it in that book. That, you know, there's not enough carbohydrate. In, in the paleo diet to fuel glycolytic exercise, period. CrossFit is glycolytic in nature. So, but here's what's happening is, and you guys talked about it two or three episodes ago. You talked about like, you know, your MAPS anabolic and the transition like in your programs, right? And how like when you start to adapt and, and there's like this adaptation phase that you change the stimulus. Mm-hmm. Well, in CrossFit, you get into CrossFit, everything is adaptation. And so it's really the brain is learning. And I've gone on record and I think that you would create the same level of results at 500 calories that you would at 5,000 calories because it's all a neurological adaptation. Mm. You're learning how to snatch. You're learning how to clean and jerk. Most of these people have never squatted. They've never mm-hmm. deadlifted. They've never run. They've never done a 20 minute AMRAP, right? So like you get into a 20 minute AMRAP and you get the person that's like, oh, I'm good at exercise. I'm going to fucking blow this out of the water. Two minutes in, they're laying on their back and they can't even finish 20 minutes, right? But learning how to pace yourself is an mm. adaptation. Um, all of these all of these things are happening for the first eight or nine months. They're neurological adaptations. Well, if you're eating a paleo diet in a calorie deficit, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose weight. You're going to be shredded. You're going to leverage a little bit of cortisol and you're going to feel great. The problem is they all hit this wall at eight or nine months Mm. in. And they're like, fuck, why did I just get weaker? How come those 50 pound PRs are 10 pound regression? How do you deal with people that don't understand it? How do you deal with people that, you know, deep down inside need to get away from CrossFit, but they absolutely love it? <laughs> that's gotta you try be, to, you gotta to be a struggle, them, right? Dude, right? Yeah. So, so like, I mean, I've I've spent the last four years majority CrossFitting, right? Um, I know for me, and and like, I, I somewhat fit that mold, right? Because, bro, my life. I flew in last night. I'm on a red eye home tonight. Like, think about what that does. Just as sure. a, just that alone yeah, as right. a stressor to the body, right? right? Yeah. Let alone the fact that I'm up at five, like working today up until you know whenever. Um, Putting CrossFit on top of that is just fucking stupid. Right. But you're addicted to that, like, you know, um, kind of hormonal response. Do like you, you catch yourself about, right? sometimes, like, when you get back, you want to go to and you know better. Dude, it's it rare be, that, you, that you recognize that. A hundred percent, right? And actually, so one of the things Josiah and I talked about this week because we've been working out, and I told him, I'm like, dude, like, I need you to tell me to shut the fuck up half the time and, <laughs> and that we need to just, like, power lift and we need to not do anything super high intense. Um, not that powerlifting is low intensity. I mean, I get the whole intensity mm-hmm. being, you know, relative to load on the bar, but, um, and, and he was like, all right, I got you, you know, but I, I needed that accountability. Otherwise it's, you know, what else is for busy people? It's easy to go to a CrossFit class. It's easy to show up, shut your brain off for an hour and do whatever the fuck they tell you to do. Right. Mm-hmm. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to be motivated because as soon as you're there, you have to do it or you look like a fucking douche, yeah. right? Like you got to do the workout. That's why it's so appealing to athletes because it it, it, it's sort of that process. Like you remember that, like yep. get, like showing up for practice, well, the coach tells you what to do, too, it's right? competing. Yeah. yeah, it definitely feeds to that. So, so that's the first thing though, right? Is that whole neurological adaptation phase with CrossFitters. Um, the other one is high level CrossFitters. And so I built this model, you know, theoretically, we all know they should be periodizing their training, right? Right. 
You should periodize. You should, they should, yeah, theoretically. <laughs> Trust me, that's a fucking big F. Um, <laughs> I should show you some of this shit. Dude, like, I, I, did you watch the, I, and I love Rich Froney, but did you watch the his the, the last Netflix series? I didn't even, I didn't realize until him, and then we had Jason Kleep on the show, and he also confirmed this. I didn't realize these fuckers were training that intense three times yeah. a day. Multiple even. times. Oh, minimum. Yeah. That's Minimum. crazy. But here's the thing, right? That's crazy. I think that Rich, so here's the thing. Look at what Rich and Jason are doing in those training sessions. They're doing AMRAPs. They're doing EMOMs. They're doing things where they can control their heart rate and the intensity across the whole thing. They're not doing fucking 21, 15, 9, like Fran, right? right. Thrusters and pull-ups, which is ironically for a two-minute workout will smash the nervous system. Mm -hmm. They're not doing fucking Murph. They're not doing things, quote unquote, for time. They're doing it where they can control the intensity. They're living at 80%. Well, what do power lifters do? They live at 80%. Sure. What do Oli lifters do? They, there's longevity in that. They're really just That's building. That's the magic number, 80%. They're just building mm -hmm. aerobic base, right, within mm -hmm. a working environment. That's why they're able to sustain the high volume. The problem is the inference that people out in the public take right. is, well, they're training three times a day. They're smashing themselves three so times a three day. Crossfit right. So let me go to fucking three classes, compete yeah. in three classes in three Ooh, different gyms and be like, I'm the motherfucker on the top of the whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm such a badass. No, dude, like you're going to suck come the open, right? Yeah. So. If they're periodizing properly, your nutrition has to match that because the demands of in-season CrossFit, like very high intensity glycolytic exercise, are not the demands of off-season CrossFit, mm. which realistically is strength and skill acquisition. The demands of intense fat loss phase versus the demands of taking some time to relax and recover the hormones, completely different. Every individual needs to look at their nutrition as a, as a much broader scope, right? And, and to a degree, it's all periodization. In CrossFit, it's true periodization. In fat loss, there is a small element of periodization with it. Right. And I think a lot of people overlook that. Right. Now, something I've said in the past that was actually I didn't, remarkably controversial was that when you're dealing with uh, the body starting to adapt to too much stress, that I found in my experience that women in particular seem to get into that HPA axis dysfunction that faster and easier that's, than I don't men think do. That's, I don't think that's controversial it's, at all. Well, it's fun. <laughs> I have people, what are you talking about? What do you do this? And it's like, no, I'm like, if I have women fast too much, yeah. if I have push, like their period stops, they start losing their hair yeah. at much sooner rates. They're also less resilient. Mm -hmm. Once they're in that HPA dysfunction, forget about it. Like mm -hmm. it is a much harder process coming out. But if you think about it, right, it all goes back. It makes to sense. It all goes back to pregnenolone, right? Right, like and and precursors and the ability to produce sex hormone. Obviously, males have a much easier and, and they're much more resilient from a sex hormone standpoint than Absolutely. females are, um, which is all going to go back to the ability to create adequate amounts of cortisol. Um, you know, pregnenolone steel is going to be much more prevalent in a female, and it's just going to be harder to recover from. Yeah. Now, now, when you look at Jay, when you look at the CrossFit community and and, and the culture around it right now. Do you, and knowing what you know and dealing with as many athletes as you have, do you feel like it's getting better or worse? At the athletic level or at the just kind of everyday just class warrior Everyday level? class warriors, you know, in general. I think it's getting worse mm -hmm. because of like the statement I said earlier. I think that because there's, the too, cosmetic there's aspect just of it? too many people that are talking about weight control and CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And like we said earlier, go back to the whole triangle of awareness thing. Performance is so far away from cosmetics. Mm -hmm. Right. There's so like absolute performance is not defined as absolute cosmetics. Now, if you're fueling your performance optimally, will cosmetics improve? Most likely. Right. But look at like, look at Matt Frazier. He is not the leanest dude at the CrossFit Games. Right. Oh, and he won by the largest margin of victory ever last year. Right. Right. By not being super shredded. Right. And, you know, not not to use names. Can I drop a name? Sure. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be super controversial, oh, but be super controversial. Oh, <laughs> this is Sorry. mind bump. Motherfucker. We're you know, if you know where you're I, at. I, right don't, now. I don't I don't want to be because, like, I know that this person works with a competitor of ours and it's not mm -hmm. a reflection of them. Right. Mm -hmm. But like Brooke Wells last year, mm -hmm. she posted a picture a week out of the CrossFit Games. Homegirl was shredded. I have a ridiculous amount of respect for what she achieved. Because I don't think her set point is super close to shredded. Like, I think she's somebody that, that needs to be a little heavier. Yeah, mm -hmm. thicker. She's a thicker friend. She's a her. thicker girl, yes. right? She also didn't have her best performance last year. Now, there could be a host of other things that, that went wrong. And I'm not in her camp. I don't understand anything that went wrong. But I have to believe that what she did to get super shredded negatively contributed to performance. Uh, especially it's when give you, and take, man. Especially when you're dealing with women. Fat is a hormone sensitive tissue. It is. And if you eliminate all of it in a woman in particular, 
you're going to have some big problems with your hormones and then your performance. Yeah. It's, Absolutely. It's a, uh, now, you know, a, what is optimal from a body fat percentage for a female to perform at a high level? I think that's super open to debate. Oh, and, I think, and, and, and I think it's going to be relative yeah. to the individual. Yes, 100%. I think Brooke being slightly heavier, I think she'd be, I think she'd perform a little better. And dude, she came fourth the year before that. She's clearly a talented girl. Right. She's young. She's resilient. She'll be back this year. She'll crush it. Um, but I think that, you know, watching that, because, dude, my phone blew up. They're like, do you see this picture? And I'm like, yeah, let's just hold out and let's see performance. Because like, initially, my inclination was, yeah, this isn't going to turn out very well. Mm-hmm. And it didn't. Um, How hard is that to tell someone who comes and hires you at that level and say, hey, look, <laughs> at, uh, we got to make you fatter. Yeah. So, so I, just <laughs> had I, a, awesome. I just had a former games client reach out to me. And she said, uh, hey, I really need you to to rebuild like my metabolism. Like I'm, I'm in a pretty fucked up place. And so we started going through things and sure enough, like she's just pretty messed up. And so, um, I told her, I said, listen, like when competition time comes around, like she's shredded, dude. Like, um, I'm like, when competition time rolls around, I might take your abs from you. Like, don't worry. I'll give them back to you <laughs> after, like, after you've been on that podium, I will give you your abs back. Right. I can absolutely do that in the off season. But right now, I don't give a fuck about abs. And and right now, from a CrossFit perspective, we're going into December. I don't know when this will air, but, you know, we're tomorrow's December 1st. Mm-hmm. And we're 12, 13 weeks out of the open. Anybody that's thinking about competing in the open right now, stop caring about your cosmetics. Do you think it's the, the TV and social media that's driving that? Fuck yeah. Right? Absolutely. Because we see these athletes that are like... Well, mm-hmm. and I, I think there's this general perception that if you're lighter, you'll be better at gymnastics. CrossFit's becoming a very gymnastic-focused modality. Like, if you look at the regionals last year, I had a lot of clients do the regionals. And, and there's, there's some truth to gym- that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's relative body strength. That's right. Right? Like, so Joe DeFranco's mm-hmm. huge on, on relative body strength. Yeah. And I think that more CrossFitters need to start understanding that concept. You know, if they if they had more relative body strength, um, then it doesn't matter for, how much you weigh. It doesn't matter what you weigh, right? Because if you can overcome your body weight a certain amount of times, you're gonna you're gonna win. Um, and so I think sometimes they have to look at themselves and be like, well, am I just not fueling enough at this weight? Uh, and that was the case two years ago where I worked with a girl who swore up and down. She's like, I got to lose weight for gymnastics. We ended up gaining two pounds. It was the first time she ever went to the games. So wow, awesome! Um, it was just proving that. Do you ever get any backlash training. for this this message? Uh, I'm sure it's out there, right? Like, like my clients that hire me don't necessarily backlash because I think they're on board with like what I'm teaching. Me. Yeah, but you've now, been on a, you've been on a lot of podcasts right. and you've done a lot of stuff out there. So yeah, I'm sure there, I'm sure there's people that are going to disagree with what I say, and that's okay. Um, you know, it's I like to live in science. I like to say like this is like go look at the fucking physiology. Like go look at the studies. It's right. not that hard to prove what I'm telling you. Um, long-term living in a deficit is not going to be advantageous for a hormone profile. Like you said, fat's a very hormone sensitive tissue. Like these things are non-negotiable. Like I I don't give a fuck what you want to come at me and think like, let's talk facts. Um, you know, the, the dispute would be, all right, well, let's take somebody the first time they've ever gone into a calorie deficit. Well, what's going to happen immediately in a deficit? Cortisol is going to rise. Cortisol is a powerful fucking hormone. So the first time you live in a deficit you're going to crush it mm-hmm. for six months and you're probably gonna have the best performance of your life until you hit that wall. This is why if you go on corticosteroid, you know, uh, hor- you know, uh, drugs or whatever, yep. because you have some kind of inflammatory disease or whatever, you ask anybody who's ever had to take corticosteroids because yep. they have some kind of inflammatory disorder and they'll tell you they feel amazing. Yeah. They feel great. Because cortisone's powerful. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a feel a great hormone. Yeah, Absolutely. It, it, it 100% is. The problem is it's not glucose. Right. No. When you run out of it, you can't just drink a shake. Right. <laughs> like there's no, there's no fucking cortisol shake. Oh, right. And, maybe, and you're, maybe we're on to something. Dude, there oh. we go. We'll, we'll be rich real cortisol soon. Shake cortisol explosion. shake. Cortisol <laughs> shake. Yeah. Um, they said cortisol will bad, was bad. We're saying it's good. There you go. Shake. See, this is what you do in the drink. Drink it. <laughs> yeah, let's make some predictions. You'll like it. Let's make some predictions. What do you predict the next fads? Because you're so entrenched in nutrition and in this whole world. Yeah. What do you think the next big fads are going to be? I have my own predictions, but I'll let you go first. Well, high carbohydrate diets will be the next thing back. Because <laughs> it was right? okay, because carbs carbs disappeared. We went away from it. For keto so long. took them. Keto put them away. Locked them in a closet. So right. they're going to break out. Um, you're going to start to see fasting go away. Carb cycling is about to get really hot again. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, man. I try not. I like. I'm so anti fads. Like, so the one question that I always get asked, what's the best dietary protocol? I don't know. Like, tell me about yourself. <laughs> right. Like I always say, if you, ask I me hate a qu- that we have names for it in the first place. Yes. It's so ridiculous. If to me. you ask me a question, 
chances are you're going to get 20 questions in re- in response. Right? Yeah. I want to know who you are. I want to know like physical stature. What's your training? Yeah. What's your dietary history? Mm. Like I want to know so much shit about you before I'll even begin to answer your question. And I think sometimes it pisses people off because they want a simple answer. Oh yeah, they would just yeah. tell me what diet's best oh, then. Yeah. I mean, right. even people listen, I know right now there's people listening and they're just waiting for you to say He's an something. asshole. Yeah. Or no, or they're no, just they're waiting to say like, the blueprint. Tell me what yeah. what's the best yeah. one then? What's yeah. the best diet? So or what's the best thing I should do? So here's the funny thing. I put an ebook out like I don't know, 2 years ago. It took me 4 fucking years to write that book. I can write a blog article 5 pages in no shit like 25 minutes. Like I'm a reasonably good writer. It took me 4 years to wrap my head around writing an ebook. And I still don't think it's that accurate, <laughs> right? Like it's it's the best of what I could do because I don't know how to generalize a population. So Bedros yeah. actually challenged me one time. He said, dude, I was at his like info marketing mastermind. And he was like, dude, I promise you, if you had to make one diet for everybody in here, you could. And the, the truth is, yes, I could. Of course. Because I would choose the worst metabolism. I would build it for that. Mm-hmm. And then all the other metabolisms that were good enough, well, they would just have to suffer because they're living on the shit metabolism, right? right? So even though I can tolerate 600 grams of carbohydrates, I would have to live on this motherfucker's 200 grams of carbs mm. and suffer. Right. And that sucks. Like, that's not fair to yeah. an individual. Well, right? our intuitive nutrition guide that we put out recently, it doesn't tell people yeah. what to eat. It no, just, right? no it's, literally, it's literally a guide teaching people giving them techniques and teaching yeah. people how, how to pay become, attention. Yeah, yeah, how to become aware of their body signals, how to connect to it so they, they can figure out for themselves what works for them at that particular moment and how to figure out as their body changes. So dude, so I would classify that as biofeedback, physiological mm-hmm. data, right? Mm-hmm. You're you're teaching somebody to become very in tune with with biofeedback. Mm-hmm. I am so massively in agreement with that. I had a client 2 years ago we, she came to me she's like oh, I fucking hate the scale. It drives me nuts. Super cool, dude. Don't ever weigh yourself. Like we can do this. Like 14 weeks later, I get a text. She's like, hey, guess what? I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, what's about to happen? Right. She's like, I got on the scale this morning. Dot, dot, dot. Fuck. What's about to happen? Right. Mm. Down like something, something like 30 pounds. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, because we listen to your body. Like <laughs> hunger signals, sleep signals, mood, like energy in the gym, recovery. Like when you're maximizing those things, the body goes where it fuck it wants to go. Amazing. Yeah. Now, was she stage ready? No. But she was super healthy, super happy, fit, looking reasonably like good. Like to get her past that set point, would we have to start looking at other metrics? Probably. But to get her at set point or slightly below set point, it was all biofeedback. Man, yeah. healthy looks good. I wish people understood that. Like if you just were healthy, you, you'd look pretty Absol- fucking awesome. Dude, absolutely. You, you'd look better than most people and you'd look better than you probably ever have. I sat down on the plane last night. I look across from me and there's this dude and they're like, I was fortunate enough to fly first class and they're, so they're giving out dinners. Right. And I like, I passed on my dinner and I always do. I feel like first class flight attendants hate me because <laughs> I, I never want to drink. I always have my own water. Right. I never want food. They're like, what can I do for you? Like, no, so wait, boring. Just, just shut up and let me sleep. Right. Like, like that's it. Like, let me listen to mind pump and let me sleep. Um, and so like, I look across and this guy, like he, he was like, no, nah, I'm good. I brought two pieces of fruit. And I'm like, oh, like, and he's like, guy I had to be in his 50s, 60s. But like, I actually started like looking him up and down. Cause I'm like, this guy is making a quality eating choice. Like the dude was a good looking guy, late in his fifties, early sixties, like skin was tight. Like all the markers that you would think of as somebody that quote unquote diets, I bet the guy just eats healthy, just eats healthy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And so exactly like healthy looks good and it provides all the things that we're all looking for anyway. Oh, and I feel great. like you, you need to go there first before you ever chase the course, extremes, right? Of course. But whether it be that, if you don't have that foundation, you can't go to the, right. to the extremes, of the yeah. triangle. You'll cause yeah. way more damage. A hundred percent. So I'm going to make, I'll make some predictions because I know I asked you to make yeah. some, but I'll make some. So, we made predictions in the past that protein would be added to everything, which now it is. You see protein cereal, protein water, protein water. It's the magic macronutrient, right? Mm-hmm. Here's the next prediction I'll make. You're going to see probiotics added to everything. Mark my mm. words. You're going, to see, you're going to see regular foods come out with added probiotics or live cultures or whatever. So you're, because it's the new, I think it's the you're, new thing. I think you're right. Yeah, because the whole gut the, thing. Here's yeah, the thing sure. that's funny is now you're starting to get a crowd that's out there that's uh that's saying that the probiotics are are actually the cause of even more problems which <laughs> i would argue like this whole kombucha craze right now mm-hmm. like people are actually feeding their yeast more than actually killing their yeast you definitely right? could like, there's I, like so overgrowth much, wise yeah, yeah. i yeah, dealt there's with this so many things i, de- I like dealt that. with this personally and i remember I, the first time i got introduced to kombucha and i remember taking one and then feeling so good yeah. and just like the fucking all the people I talk shit about <laughs> you did the same so thing. I start fucking <laughs> drinking it every yeah. day because I feel great and it got up. worse yes yeah. and then I noticed if I would didn't have it my, felt I, better. I'd feel all yes you're feeding the yeast yes yeah you're just making it even worse crazy and so, <laughs> so you'll start to see that and ironically on the protein thing 
what's all the research right now? Yeah. It's showing you don't even need near as much protein as we've close. been claiming for years. Like yeah, it's right. not even close. No, and I mean, it, it, depending on the context, obviously, too much protein can be very bad for you. Fuck yeah. It can feed cancer. So do you, you remember, like sugar do you remember Mike Davies? Yes. The Fitness Factory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so he was my first ever like coach. Oh, wow. Okay. And this guy, um, his whole thing was on, uh, what did he call it? BV value. Because I asked him one day. Oh, like, yeah, bio how do, you, how do you build your diet? Well, it's on BV value. So you're telling me that the whole structure of a contest diet should be built based on the rate at which protein digests or the availability of your protein. Like, that's fucking weird, yeah. right? Like, so you're just eating whole eggs all day yeah, long? Like, yeah. <laughs> whole eggs as you, as you got close to a, As you got close to a diet, it was all like egg whites, oh fish, and tuna, and shit. And I was like, all right, whatever. This guy sent... So I was dating a, a girl that was a figure pro at the time, and we were both working with him. And he sent us our diet. It was the same diet <laughs> to the letter. No. I had like two or three more ounces of protein at every meal. Oh and I God. actually went to the hospital one day during prep. My gut was so fucked. Like I couldn't burp. I couldn't shit. I couldn't like, <laughs> I couldn't fart. Like I couldn't do anything, dude. It was so like, I was like, something's wrong. And of course I went on Dr. Google and I'm like looking up all the shit. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Like yeah. I need to go to the hospital, you know? And of course like, I'm in prep and I'm calorie deprived and life sucked. But, oh dude, I mean, high protein diets. I'm, I'm somebody that absolutely needs under like either at or under body weight and protein. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm the same way. Most people I find are like I, I, most people. And so I'm actually starting to the literature I'm excited about. And uh, there's a faction down in Atlanta that's starting to study it, I think, is protein intake relative to um, like a, a anaerobic or aerobic capacity. Mm. And I, I think that you're with CrossFit and with other high intensity training modalities, you're actually going to start to see people interplaying levels of protein there mm -hmm. and figuring out what is best for, for cardiac output. How mm -hmm. about how about mm -hmm. protein fasting every once in a while? I think it's a genius idea. Yeah, I think it's. I think fasting in general, assuming you're Depending not, on the right assuming yeah. you're not an in season like high level athlete, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, again, in the right protocol. But as a whole, there's so many benefits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, after finding your set point, I think it's an excellent tool. Yes, but that's the key, right? That's you yeah. have to be there before you. And, and I mean, and I've had success with people. <laughs> ironically and this is the complete fucked up application but this is like again listening to an individual and working with them who are metabolically adapted that when you're adding in calories i don't know if you've seen if you've worked with someone where you add the calories and they're like i'm so bloated i just can't eat the yeah food. i've actually used fasting in that protocol to create a hunger response to actually get them to eat enough calories yeah i do that and i've had really good success with that as well it's counterintuitive because you're like, I need to feed you more, mm -hmm. but first I got to feed you less. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think it's it's like you're just listening diet, to them, man. dude. You're listening the to the whole them. thing, dude. Yeah. You're listening to an individual. You're not you're not yeah. living on a fucking template, right? You're not living in some ebook that you wrote. Like you're you're listening to an individual and figuring out. Just like you guys talked about, like the intuitive piece, like. You're listening to your body. Your body will always tell you what it wants. Oh, love that. Jay, when did love you that. first come across Mind Pump? Who, was it after uh, Jay or was it, who are you? How do you not, right? I like, I wish I could be like, man, this is how I came across it. Um, are we everywhere? Instagram for <laughs> sure was probably the first exposure oh, yeah. to it. Adam probably. Uh, He's handsome. He's so handsome. <laughs> so I, us. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what, what the first exposure was. I know uh, Jay created the introduction. Mm -hmm. um, and I obviously knew about you guys prior to Jay because I was like, oh, that introduction would be amazing. Um, and then I recently can, and you guys just did some work with Amanda Bucci, right? Yeah. yeah. I just connected with her a week or two ago from Daniel DiPiazza. Oh, she's a, bro she's a brilliant young lady. She's super smart. Charismatic, dude. brilliant so young lady. I, I did a call with her last week and I said, um, so are you helping her now with her nutrition? Service? No. So oh. she, she works with somebody and he's awesome. Um, but I think I'm going to record with her the week before Christmas. Actually, my wife and I are doing our baby moon in uh in laguna oh cool and so we're gonna hook up with her and brian brian's her boyfriend right You're right, right yeah. Yeah, yeah so we're gonna hook up with them do dinner and do a whole podcast thing and uh, but daniel di piazza created that introduction do you guys know him no oh dude rich 20 something you guys i need oh. to create that connection for oh, you oh that's guys. taylor has been trying to connect to him for oh perfect yeah quite i'll some connect time. you guys yeah. daniel's perfect. awesome perfect he, we appreciate yeah. it yeah he's a really good dude well wow. you're doing good things man yeah i appreciate yeah. that yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude. we have the right mentality for yeah sure. we, we love connecting with people who you know we feel are doing the right things uh, for the industry and i think connecting with all these people and having people work together is going to he is going to elevate the industry as a whole and this is a message that needs to get out i, th I think that you know I, I live by this all day you know i mean i've been very fortunate to help a lot of people but i think that the reality is you know, 50 60 years from now like we're all going to pass and and you know we can't take any of our material items to the grave but we definitely can leave this society in a better place 
And I think that you guys would agree a lot of what comes to us today, we're fixing the mistakes of generations past. Mm -hmm. If we can create a generation today that is doing the right thing, the next generation beyond us will spend time optimizing, right. not fixing. Mm. And I think if we actually are doing our part and we're doing it correctly, um, as we're leaving this universe, we'll see a universe built on optimization versus correction. And that will be like validation that everything I've done is correct. Dude, what's what's that's the, the legacy right there? What's the future of what you're working on like right now, like your business? Like, are you, do you want to just keep it where it's at? You've got your nice team. You've, you've got a living for yourself or what are you trying to do? <laughs> no, dude, the, 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 uh, I'm always working on something like I'm too, uh, I'm too ADD to not, yeah. um, so we just launched our education platform. That's my big thing. Um, so we opened up the Nutritional Coaching Institute. And so I look around. Explain and, what that and looks like. What does that look like? Uh, so I'll give you kind of the, the the background and I'll tell you how people can come into it and give like the, the whole thing. But, you know, so I looked around. There's no nutritional certifications out there that I think are like amazing. Right. Um, I think there's some precision nutrition teaches amazing education. Um, anyone that comes out super knowledgeable, they know how to talk about food um, in and out. But the problem is, how do you deal with applying uh, that to people? how do you deal with applying it to all the all the situations we just talked about for like mm -hmm. the last hour hour and yeah, a half? How do you right? troubleshoot? You can't like they don't teach you that shit. Mm -hmm. um, and what I looked around is there's nothing built on application, and I was like, fuck that! Like that's where I win. I yeah. win based on application. Um, so our certifications are all twofold. Um, you come to our level one nutrition coach. Day one is science. You have to know the science to be able to speak about it. We teach you all that stuff. Uh, very similar information as precision. Um, and then day two is application. And so we talk about everything from like, what are you learning in the intake? Like, what's the psychology behind the intake? Um, like, how can you engage with your clients? How do you troubleshoot a client? And we spend a whole day based on application. And then our test is unique too. So it's uh, there, you complete three 90 day case studies. And what I need to see is how did you create your intake? Like, what does your intake form look like? Why did you create it that way? How did you set up a client prescription? Why did you set it up? Show me all of your client interaction for 90 days and tell me why you were successful, why you weren't successful, what things you were reading from the clients. Um, and if you can successfully articulate that, I think that you've shown competency in the practice of nutrition coaching wow. and I will certify you. Um, now we've built extension courses. So we have a mindset specialty course, we have a hormone specialty course, and we have a business system specialty course. And that's all of our level one. Um, and then level two launches at the end of this of next year. Very cool. Dude, I would yeah, love awesome. for you to come out here and host one of those here out of our place. Let's do it. I yeah. think that would that be, would be amazing. I yeah. think that would be fucking, I think our fans would love that. Yeah, yeah no, I think that'd be super rad. Be rad. And you're definitely the type of person who I feel like, at least I, I'm pretty sure all the boys would agree that would put our stamp of approval on guys dropping knowledge and information because this is the stuff that not a lot of people are talking about. Nobody's talking about all the individual variances. It's always about camps yep. of doing it this way, my way is better than your way, mm -hmm. and then trying to prove each other wrong versus, no, there's it could be a lot of different ways. Uh, no, Nothing's right. Like I'm never right. I'm never wrong. Right. And and I actually think that the the foundation of nutrition coaching and, and application in general is state your case. Like, why are you doing it this way? I don't give a fuck if science tells you everything you're doing is right the body might prove you wrong. Mm -hmm. The body is going to do what it wants to do. Mm -hmm. You have to have a really good reason for why you're about to do what you're about to do. And if you put that into play, <clears throat> let's watch the body. Let's let's pull a K star, right? Let's test. Let's retest. And like so, with with nutrition, let's assess. Let's see what feedback the body gives us physically, physiologically. Let's reassess. Let's re-implement. And that's really it is. That's really all it is. Like that's the that's the course of my work with any client. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, yeah man. thank you guys. For having great, me. great time, Jay. Really Won't be the last it. time we do this. Yep, definitely. Uh, and we'll go shoot some, uh, maybe some video content. Let's do it. Uh, excellent. Awesome. Check it out. Go to YouTube Mind Pump TV. We've got some awesome videos on there. In fact, I hope we have one that's up there live uh, when this airs with uh, me and Jason talking about some of the stuff on on video. Let's do it. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome, brother. Cool. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. 
If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support. And until next time, this is Mind Pump.